This is a special episode of History As It Happens podcast. We are on location at George Washington's Mount Vernon inside the Washington Library, and this is the first in a two-part series of conversations about Washington's legacy, the importance and mission of institutions such as Mount Vernon, and the importance of conversation during moments of hyperpolarization and division in our society. I have the honor of being joined by two marvelous scholars of early American history. With me here in the library is the president and chief executive of Mount Vernon, Doug Bradburn. On behalf of the Washington Times, thank you for welcoming me to this special place. I'm glad to be here, Martin. Thank you for coming. I love the library. I could walk around in there all day long. I feel I'll just get smarter by just absorbing the, the vapors, if you will. And joining us via Zoom from his home in the birthplace of the American Revolution, Massachusetts, Joseph Ellis. Hello, Joseph. Pleasure to be with you, Martin. And good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Last time I saw you was here. You gave a talk. That's right. That's right. In the auditorium. Were you there, Dr. Bradburn, for that one? I probably was. was. I've mostly yeah. been here whenever Joe's speaking. He's one of our best historians, and we always want to hear what he has to say. As our listeners know, Joseph Ellis has written essential books about what we're going to discuss today, including His Excellency, George Washington, which I read to prepare for this conversation. Joseph, let me thank you for not writing a thousand-page book. because uh, I don't do thousand pages. <laughs> that would have made my preparation a lot more difficult. It comes in at a tidy Something like 280 pages. Terrific book. My, my writerly instincts were developed as a teacher, and I knew that if I went on too long, nobody would be paying any attention. So the unofficial title of this episode is What Washington Wanted, His Vision for the Country. Uh, I mentioned it's the first of two conversations we're going to record here. Number two will come out on Thursday, October 13th, focusing on the challenges you're facing here amid the history wars. But let's begin with something that I grapple with as a journalist, with an interest in history as an American citizen. It's the reason why I got in touch with you about coming here. And that is, why should we still listen to our founders, what George Washington said, what wisdom he left us, that can be applied to our dramatically different world that we're living in now compared to his? Maybe that's a weird question to ask a couple of historians, but I'll explain why I'm asking it after you answer it. Dr. Bradburn. Well, that's a big question, and that's yes. something I spend a lot of my day thinking about and talking about to different groups. And I think I'd break it down in a couple of different ways. The United States of America is a self-governing nation, the idea being that the people govern themselves. This is an idea that came into force and being at the time of the nation's birth. And you can't understand the nation's birth without the story of George Washington. He's the leader of the army that wins the war. He's the essential figure that comes together at the Constitutional Convention to form a more perfect union to revise the Articles of Confederation, and he's the first president of the United States. So there's the basic civic purpose of understanding that history of our founding, of which Washington is, as one historian has called him, the indispensable man. Uh, without him, you can't really understand it. So he's still important for that basic, and that's sort of the 101 civics reason why his stories need to be learned, need to be taught, need to be thought about. And then there's broader and maybe more abstract reasons that are connected to the values that we share as a nation. And yes, we are a nation that shares values, some of which come out of that founding. There are probably other foundings in the United States as well in which values have been refined and shared. But one of those I think everybody would agree on is civilian control of the military. In this country, that has come directly from the example and experience of George Washington as the father of the American army and in the way that he established civilian authority over his regime and the birth of the country. So that's a value that I think all Americans agree on. Yeah, we've never slipped from that. And thank goodness that we haven't because in, no, in times of peril in republics all over the world, Whenever people fight over the outcome of elections, the army steps in. The army as a political entity has destroyed more mm. republics than it's established. And Washington's example is a critical one in establishing that value. And there's other values as well. And I'll let Joe speak to this question of which he's written about quite a bit. But I'll, I'll mention one other one, and this is not the only one. But certainly George Washington in giving up power and walking mm. away from the opportunity to lead the nation to a more perfect union as the indispensable leader at the end of the war when there was still much to be done. In fact, when he resigned his commission, he had a circular to the governors of all the states saying that 
you know, the hard part is yet to come. The hard work is yet to come. So he wasn't leaving when he thought it was over. And similarly, when he stepped down after two terms as president, establishing a precedent that lasted obviously until FDR and then, of course, as part of the amended constitution today. Again, these are aspects of the way we think about how our leaders are civilians. They are citizens like the rest of us. They can become the supreme head of the country, but then they also go back into the citizenry. And that is uh, the magic of representation and and a citizen-run nation. So that's another fundamental value that Americans need to understand. So those are two, and there are others I can go into besides the basic 101 of civics that make George Washington's stories in particular still valuable. Joseph Ellis, why do we keep calling on the founders? Well, in the first place, you're right to assume that there's something strange about it, because trying to bring the founders from the 18th century into the present is like trying to plant cut flowers. Hmm. They lived in a pre-democratic, pre-capitalistic, pre-Darwin, pre-Freud, pre-Marx, a good many things. That said, all emerging nations, especially those that become world powers, seem to require mythical heroes. Greece had Ulysses, Rome had its own heroic figures. England has King Arthur, Romulus and Remus are the ones I was thinking of with regard to Rome. All of these are fictional or semi-fictional characters. And the United States created its own mythology around the founders. And for over a hundred years, even the scholarship on the founders described them as demigods. They saw God face to face. We could only see him secondhand. That started to die in the early 20th century. And we began to think of the founders not as icons, not as demigods, but as human beings. And that's been the basis of my own work over the last 40 years, that we must recover them as imperfect human beings. In fact, if they were gods, what in heaven's name would we have to learn from? Think about the parent-child analogy. When you're a child, you think of your parents as godlike figures. They can do no wrong. And at some point in early adolescence, they cross the line. And after they cross that line, guess what? You can do no right. And in fact, if Freud is right, they want to kill you. And that metaphor applies to the views of the founders. In some sense, they go from mythical heroes to the deadest, whitest males in American history in a glance. Two things are true. They are imperfect, and they're the greatest generation of political leadership in American history. And George Washington is the greatest president in American history and the greatest leader in American history. Those are all truths. They're all, however, subject to criticism. They fail in certain respects. The American founding has enormous triumphs. First successful war for colonial independence in history, the creation of the first nation-sized republic in world history, the separation of church and state, as Doug has suggested, civilian control of the military. Anti-slavery movement. Uh, Well, here are the failures. They they begin the first anti-slavery movement in the world. That's true. But the founders failed to put slavery on the road to extinction, as they, many of them, including Washington, wanted to do. We're going to get into the issue of race and slavery in a bit. And they also failed to reach a just accommodation with the Native Americans. And once again, Washington makes a heroic effort on that score in 1790. Nevertheless, the triumphs and the tragedies go together. That's what a great epic is. And the founders are part of that. And trying to understand them as human beings who succeeded in marvelous ways, but failed in ways that we would have now liked them to succeed, that's part of the story. And I should let our listeners know that we're going to discuss what Washington wanted in terms of factionalism and partisanship, slavery and race relations, as well as foreign policy and empire. But before we get granular into those issues, a couple of other points about the big picture here. Doug, you said a nation founded on certain values. That's different than other countries. We don't have a common ethnic lineage here, a common religion or language or culture. From the beginning, the United States has always been an amalgam. European, African, Native American. I don't have to explain this too deeply here to a couple of historians. You know what I'm talking about. But we were were founded on certain values. But when we go back to the founders, we're often disappointed that they didn't live up to those values in their own lifetime. I guess that's what I'm kind of grappling with as I approach these subjects and present them to the public in my podcast. 
Well, I think that's a good perspective. It, in the one hand, you could look at it as base hypocrisy, which is sort of a simplistic way to think about it. On the other, it's to recognize that they created a creed that's so powerful that here we are 220 odd years later, we can hold that up and hold it against them and say they're not as smart as we are 220 years later. And then we maybe sound a little silly because they grew up in a world in which the ideals that were expressed in the Declaration of Independence, refined in the amendments of the Constitution, are things that they weren't taught growing up. They grew up in a hierarchical world in which the assumption was that people were unequal. Uh, They grew up in a monarchical world in which the assumption was that your birth is the thing that decides who you'll be for the rest of your life. They grew up in a world in which it was assumed that the font of truth was divinely given to the absolute ruler who therefore then insisted upon it from everyone and punished people for their beliefs of conscience. Uh, They grew up in a world in which slavery was the absolute norm. It's in the Bible. It was everywhere. Uh, It was expected. It was the fundamental way things were done. And they led a revolution in which all these things were challenged and challenged in a way that helped birth the modern assumptions that we take for granted today that we all grew up with. So it's easy for us to understand. But, you know, I grew up in a world in which something like gay marriage was completely inconceivable to my parents. And now it's a human right and celebrated as that. We as did rec- I, and I'm a bit younger than yeah, you. We, we, look, we have to recognize that they, <laughs> they came from an early modern world. And we celebrate the liberating ideas that are the aspirations and have been the aspirations of this nation that, guess what, our parents didn't live up to let alone people 200 and whatever years ago. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, there's a different ways to look at that question, and I prefer to look at it as the optimistic side of it. Hey, Joseph, let me just add, uh, the reason I bring that up is because, as you know, some people today will still claim the founders for themselves, while we do have a more, I'll say, young people who say, you know, I don't want anything to do with these folks anymore, these 18th century dudes who talked about mm-hmm. liberty and wound up enslaving millions of people. You get what I'm saying. Right. I taught undergraduates for 44 years at some pretty good schools, Yale, West Point, Mount Holyoke, Williams, Amherst. My experience, and those are gifted students, the typical undergraduate cannot imagine anything happened before he or she was born. The sin of a historian, let's put it this way, if the original sin of American history is slavery, the original sin of a historian is presentism the presumption that you can read the values of your time back into the past and fairly understand it. A historian has to recover the past on its own terms. That is the world of Washington at Mount Vernon and the founders at general, as they saw it. We're not judges, we're witnesses. We're not here to prosecute or to go the other way at all. We're here to understand that world, and all judgments can only occur after you do understand it. Suppose you went to Samoa and you came back and said, boy, it's really awful. Those people don't practice the child-rearing guidelines of Dr. Spock. You always or get a Star Trek a, reference in, you know that? You know, or if you go to a, Not a that English, Dr. Spock. <laughs> well, nobody does Dr. Spock anymore, I guess. That's yeah. outdated already. Yeah, yeah. You go to a London restaurant and you criticize the waiter for speaking with a foreign accent. It's really funny almost, but that recovering the past on its own terms has to be the the goal of a responsible historian. When you recover the, the world of Washington, you're going to recover a world that's extraordinary. And one of the things that I like about Washington is that he changed over time. If you read the early papers of Washington, when he's talking about his slaves, he's talking about that the same way he talked about his sheep, his goats, and his his dogs. The war was an educational experience for him, in part because of the African-American soldiers serving in the Continental Army to include his manservant, Billy Lee, that was with him the whole way, in part because the people around him as his aides, Lafayette, Alexander Hamilton, John Lawrence, all were of the belief that this was a war in the end, not just for American independence, but also for emancipation, the abolition of slavery. He was forced to deal with those ideas in a way that he never had before. You want him to solve this problem and to take a position that led in Virginia and the country, because if anybody, anybody 
could have made a fundamental difference at that point in time. It was Washington. So, but he doesn't put it in the in the farewell address. He doesn't say anything about it in a speech as president. And the reason is that he knows that if you raise slavery, attack slavery frontally, if you raise it as a political problem, you put the republic and the union itself at risk. And since the preservation of a nation-sized republic is his greatest legacy, he's always confronted with that conflict. He said, he said, we have to defer a discussion of slavery. And he gave a specific date till 1808. The slave trade. That was that was the year that the Constitution permitted us to stop the slave trade. He said, if we wait that long, by then the Republic will be sufficiently stable that we can handle this. But it was going to have to be a decision from the top down. It wasn't going to come from the bottom up because the majority of the white citizenry wanted slavery and could not imagine a biracial society. They're fighting that too. So an assessment of Washington is you're always going to be disappointed if you bring a wholly moralistic and presentistic perspective. You bring a historical perspective, he's one of the most impressive of all. What did Washington expect to happen to slavery? Did he think it was going to die out on its own or slowly wither away? And why did I he think believe that, that? Washington believed and hoped that slavery would be put on the road to extinction. You could not do it quickly. And he believed that the states in the North that were already ending slavery, and starting with Vermont in 77 and throughout the North, the last state to do it is New Jersey, that that was the beginning of the end. Virginia then needed to be the leader in the Southern states. Virginia was the largest state. Remember, it included what is now West Virginia and Kentucky. It had the largest slave population and it had the largest free black population. Virginia needed to take the lead. And if they did, eventually the Deep South, the Carolinas and Georgia would probably follow. That's what he hoped for. But let me also say, he said before he died, I want it known that if the sectional conflict leads to a civil war. You must know that I would side with the North. He's the only prominent Virginia statesman ever to say that. And all the other prominent statesmen who had children that served in the war, all of them served on the side of the Confederacy. So, Doug, did George Washington make an effort in his lifetime? And Joseph alluded to this before. Did he make an effort to either end slavery or ameliorate it? Well, Joe, I think, presented nicely the idea that really Washington before the American Revolution doesn't seem to have any ideas any different from any Virginia planter, and that the war and the experience of the war not only is associated with these sort of firebrands that he knew well, but also his experience of leading African-American men. I mean, the army that goes to Yorktown is one-fifth black. Uh, it's the most integrated army that America is going to see until the Truman administration, in fact. And those were freed African Americans. Freed African men, exactly. And it's clear in the 1780s that we're getting inkling that Washington is sort of reconsidering his traditional ideas about slavery, both from an economic point of view, but also from an ethical perspective. In fact, there's some Quakers who visit him at Mount Vernon, and they leave uh, saying that Washington believes what they believe, that slavery should be ended. Washington is heard saying that he thinks that slavery should be ended, but it has to be ended by legislation. And this is before the Constitution, so he's talking about sort of in Virginia legislation. The Virginians, as Joe pointed out, I mean, they were the largest state. They also led, through Jefferson's efforts, the uh, attempt to cede the territories that Virginia claimed to the federal government with the caveat that they would be banned from slavery. And that ends up being manifested in the Northwest Ordinance. And in fact, the effort to make all Western territories free from slavery failed by one vote in the Articles of Confederation. So the 1780s are a dynamic time in which there is a possibility that institution which they still could kind of blame on the British, you know, maybe something was going to happen to it. But I, as Joe pointed out, I mean, the decision Washington makes is that the Constitutional Convention clearly never really articulates in a way that we would love to have it figured out, but clearly he's a part of those compromises that says that slavery and the slave trade won't be touched until 1808, which the fact that it could possibly be touched was seen by some anti-slavery advocates like Benjamin Rush as a great victory, while as others see it as a great loss, particularly from today's 
perspective. Washington, then, his own private decisions about slavery at Mount Vernon are undergoing a dramatic evolution in the 1790s. He creates a map, uh, what's called the Five Farms map here at Mount Vernon, which is an extraordinary document. It's not only a survey of his farms, and by that point, he's got 8,000 acres and five outlying farms. He's got hundreds of people who are enslaved working in gangs in those locations. So on the one hand, it's a great tool that historians and here at Mount Vernon, we can use to understand that enslaved community at a certain moment in time. But the reason he makes this map is to send it to a man named Arthur Young in England, and he's asking Young to help him find some English farmers that could come over and take over his outlying farms and convert them into places with free employees, with the idea that he would fade some way to transition enslaved laborers into employees working on these outlying farms. Now, that is not a scenario that ever played out or he was ever able to figure out, certainly before he died, which was only five years after he created that map. But yeah, he's clearly trying to think of a future beyond the one that he'd grown up with that fit more with his ideas about slavery's merits, uh, both economically and, and morally, for the future of the country. And of course, in his last will and testament, he does free the slaves that he owns upon the death of Martha. He had uh, no heirs, no male heirs. He had no heirs of his body. He That's had, right. of course, heirs of his estate yes. who were nephews and related to okay. the Washington family. Yeah, but but yes, he had no heirs of, of uh, with Martha. Well, the reason I brought that up is Annette Gordon-Reed has made this point about Washington freeing his slaves, that if he had sons of his own, maybe he would have made a different decision. I don't know if we can speculate about that. Yeah, perhaps, but uh, he has heirs of the estate and the lands, and he got Lawrence Lewis, his nephew, who's Mm -hmm. married to his granddaughter by Martha. He gives Bushrod Washington, his the son of his favorite brother, the estate. And so to assume that, well, just because he didn't have his own sons, therefore he would have kept slavery around. I mean, I think that's Uh, I think there's no record for that. I mean, that's an assumption. And people criticize Washington for not freeing the slaves immediately upon his own death. But the reality is, after Carter had freed 500 slaves in Virginia, the Virginia Assembly changed the law, which gave the widow her one-third dower right, no matter whether the master freed slaves or not in the will. And so by leaving it until Martha's death, there was no way that her heirs would be able to sell any of those people that Washington was trying to free. And he's very aware of that law, and he's very careful in the way he writes it up, saying that no one will be able to stop the execution of this intent and provides for the maintenance of the people that are freed in his estate well into the 1840s. I'm curious why why Annette thinks, and I am good friends with Annette and admire her a great deal, but Jefferson had his own kids in in, uh, Monticello, and he never freed the slaves. And he didn't free Sally Hemings either. This was a brief um, reference in Annette Gordon-Reed's book about the Hemingses of Monticello, where she makes this comparison. So, Joseph, there were 293,000 slaves in Virginia in 1790. That was uh, 42% of all slaves in the United States at that time. Uh, Washington was in favor of curtailing or ending the slave trade in 1807-1808. He also believed that there could be an interracial society in our country? Yeah, he's one of the few that thinks that's a possibility. If you believe in abolition in Virginia, you automatically believe that once freed, all the African Americans need to be sent somewhere else, preferably out of the country altogether to the Caribbean or to Sierra Leone or wherever. That's the liberal position in Virginia. He's one of the few people, and Jefferson is a firm advocate of that, what Jefferson calls expatriation. Washington, in his will, he supports the blacks who are still slaves up until a certain age, and at which point they're free, and they have a certain amount of money and education by that time. And he presumes they're going to live on in Virginia. And they do. They live up in Fairfax County. And they create a black community up there that I think to some extent is still alive and has still, can still trace its origins all the way back there. So the belief blacks and whites can live together in the same society after abolition is a very rare idea in Virginia, very unusual for any leader. And of all of the prominent Virginia slave owners, Washington is the only one who frees his slaves in his will. So what happens in Virginia is they pass a law in 1782, which allows owners of slaves to free them without getting a special permission of the assembly. This is the first time in 100 years that a Virginia master could 
free their slaves. And you see a growth of a free black community for the first time. At the time, there's really only about 5,000 free African Americans in the whole Chesapeake, including Maryland and Virginia. By 1810, that number is going to be upwards of 50,000. And this law that allowed emancipation that Washington took advantage of in his will was actually called later on the partial emancipation of slavery. Because it wasn't only masters that freed slaves like out of their benevolence, it was slaves that were allowed to buy their own freedom and then remain in the community and buy the freedom of their family members and that sort of thing because it legally could happen. But that is something the Virginians repeal. They repeal it after Gabriel's rebellion, after a series of laws that are restricting the rights of free blacks to education, to freedom of movement, to basic civil rights as we would consider them today. And then they repeal this, what's called the partial emancipation of slavery in in 1807, eight years after Washington's death. There's a window of opportunity in in the revolutionary fervor between 1782 and really Washington's death and and immediately after that's Gabriel's Rebellion, in which you could imagine a different world, but that is rejected by the Virginia leaders who, as Joe is saying, can't imagine this world Mm -hmm. in which free blacks are a desirable thing to have in your society. And this has always been a... Go ahead, Joseph. I'm just going to amplify what Doug is saying. There are a series of nails that go in the coffin of the idea of emancipation in the 1790s. Yeah. In the South. In the South. Um, The Haitian Rebellion Mm -hmm. in 1793 is a big deal, especially in areas of Virginia where whites are a statistical minority. It seems threatening as the Dickens. South Carolina is even worse. But you see the nails going into the coffin as Virginia keeps moving away from any real commitment to emancipation. The real final nails go in with the Virginia dynasty. I'm a Virginian. Mm -hmm. I went to the College of William and Mary. I was raised in this world. They're so proud of the Virginia dynasty. But it's the presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe that insist that the federal government has no right or authority to rule on the issue of slavery. It must be a state-based thing. That's the Virginia view writ large. And once you put that in place, it's impossible to do anything about slavery. And they claim their real reason is because any federal government represents a second coming of parliament. And I think that Jefferson's authentic about that. But it just so happens that that view makes ending slavery impossible. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. This issue has always been fraught. It's especially fraught these days, talking about race and slavery in American history. After the 1619 Project, the murder of George Floyd, and this notion that racism, slavery, white supremacy were the driving factors in American history. But I think the problem here is folks projecting a pro-slavery ideology, talking about slavery as a positive good rather than apologizing for it as an evil that we can't get rid of. That ideology doesn't exist in the 1790s. That comes later, 18. 1830s, 1840s. There's a couple things going on in that historiographical overview. I mean, the reality is, is slavery in the Atlantic world is ever present. Say at uh, Washington's birth in the 1730s, there's slavery in Brazil, there's slavery in Mexico, there's slavery in the Caribbean, there's slavery in Africa, there's slavery in parts of Southern Europe, and the slave trade being encouraged by the great powers uh, in Europe itself. The idea that this is like a wholly American, i.e. United States problem, the distinct aspect of our culture, you know, really misses that context of the fact that this is a Western hemisphere yeah. issue and continues to be in many, many ways. I agree with you 100%. And, and the founding of the United States is a rejection of ideas that allow for the notion that that's a normal state of affairs. And it has to be figured out through politics over the course of that founding period. And Joe and I have just been talking about ways in which there were emancipatory moments which ended slavery for the first time in Western history on any kind of scale uh, that were the process of the political mobilization of the northern states and the new constitutions and the dynamics of fighting over what that would mean. And you get in Virginia this gradual turn away from those liberating impulses and tendencies that that did go into place, that passed the 1782 bill, that created the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, that created the Northwest Ordinance. These are all Virginia-led things. And so that has to be turned away from. And that does happen in the early 19th century. And so I think the simplicity of kind of saying, 
a slavery exists in 1619 in Virginia when you're talking about a very small yes. portion for a very long time, and therefore we have this problem today. You know, it's, also King it's, Cotton. It's, it's not a helpful way to think about that dynamic right. aspect of history itself. King Cotton was not around in 1799. Yeah, I was writing a biography of Jefferson. He's Secretary of State in 1792, and weirdly, that office is responsible for approving new inventions, and a thing comes through something from a guy at Yale that's called the cotton gin, and he says, I have but one question, does it work? The cotton gin will revolutionize the Southern economy, and they don't foresee that. One of the reasons that Washington's more confident about the future than it turns out he should have been. I also want to add another perspective to what Doug is saying, and it's an attitude I've developed fairly recently in my own work on slavery and the founders, and it's undoubtedly affected by the world we're living in now. It's undoubtedly affected by the fact that we're witnessing an attempt to move back in time, make America great again in a way that undoes much of the civil rights movement. And we're liable to see some of that in the current Supreme Court decisions coming up. I would have never predicted that. And it makes me aware the extent to which racism is an enduring American value. It's always there and always will be. The great historian David Brian Davis, God rest his soul, coined a phrase, the perishability of revolutionary time. And that's what Doug and I were talking about earlier. There was an open window here for a while, as long as the memory of the revolution was still alive. And Davis is saying, once that starts to fade, you start to get a fading commitment to emancipation. I think that Davis is right, but I would amplify or add to his thing. And it's a part, the first step in a backlash movement that is throughout American history and that we are going through the fourth manifestation of right now. Namely, every step forward on the racial front generates a backlash. The idea that you're going to end slavery raises the question, what happens to the freed slaves? In the North, the answer is easy. We segregate them. In the South, where the numbers are much larger, the only answer is send them somewhere else. Once that becomes impossible, there's no answer. Our belief in the values of what we call a biracial or a multiracial society did not exist in the United States or anywhere in the world at that time. And it's what happens when slavery ends that's the killer here. The problem isn't the founders. The problem is democracy. That is, the vast majority of the white citizenry cannot imagine themselves living alongside a free black population. And that population is built in for demographic reasons because of Atlantic slave trade patterns. What is it? 13 to 15 percent of the population at that time or 20 percent of the population at that time is African-American. By the way, the term African-American comes into existence in 1782 for the first time. Most of the slaves at Mount Vernon are second and third generation Americans. They don't speak African. And when you free them and you say you want to go back to Africa, they say, are you crazy? Nobody wants to go back to Africa. What do you mean Um, back to Africa? They were born. It's not back for them. What I'm saying is the racism question underlies this in a deep and profound way that we should recognize because One of the reasons that some people believe that the 2020 election was fraudulent is because they don't believe that, quote, those people are supposed to vote. That's the truth. I think that in this sense, presentism, which I've condemned earlier as an original sin of history, also is unavoidable. All historians are writing about then, then from the perspective of now. You can't escape that. And in here I'm saying one of the insights that I think we should bring back to the 18th century is that the failure isn't the failure of the political elite. The failure is of the population as a whole, the white population as a whole. So let's move on now to another area of what Washington wanted when it comes to partisanship and faction and the political bickering that starts to tear at the fabric of the the young republic. In his farewell address, which was written in 1796, 
Apparently, uh, it was a great uh, ratings on TV. Uh, all, all the networks are tuned in. Uh, Washington says, <laughs> <laughs> he says, this spirit, referring to the spirit of faction, unfortunately is inseparable from our nature, having its root in the strongest passions of the human mind. It exists under different shapes in all governments, more or less stifled, controlled, or repressed. But in those of the popular form, it is seen in its greatest rankness and is truly their worst enemy. <laughs> well, if he only could be alive today to, to see the way <laughs> we're ripping each other to shreds online and everything. Doug, what, what do you think of Washington's warnings about faction and partisanship and hyperpolarization? Yeah, I think they're on point for sure. Uh, you know, and it's incredible. He's got great letters on this, including the farewell address, obviously, but you know, letters to Hamilton, to Jefferson, where he's asking them both to recognize that men are not angels, that if we could always be right, then, you know, we wouldn't have the need for government, that we need to recognize that not every difference of opinion is a difference of principle, words that Jefferson's going to himself steal for his own That's first right. inaugural. We're all uh, federalists. That this will cause the wheels of government to clog that our efforts to build this goodly fabric will fail and our enemies will triumph, which is the critical thing. The people that thought this experiment couldn't work will be proved right. That's the worst case scenario and, and the union would collapse. It's both, I think, humbling uh, to recognize that Washington himself couldn't stop this within his own cabinet, let alone within the broader tenor of society. But it also, I think, is recognition one part and one aspect of American political life has been people warning about this from the beginning and that the voices of moderation are essential and also part of the conversation. Passion, as he points out, is going to always exist. You know, as Hamilton points out in Federalist 10, like the things that will solve that problem would destroy Republican government itself. So it's a warning that we need to heed and listen to, that people need to be a little more humble in the way they walk with their opinions, particularly in a complicated world that we live in today when misinformation is so powerful and so quick to polarize people and to fit into their own narratives. People will say, well, look, these are my principles and I believe in them and I'm going to fight for them. And that's going to be a fundamental part of American political life, as it always has. But there also needs to be those voices saying, yeah, but we got to get things done. And yeah, but we got to live together uh, because the alternative is revolution. And that's not going to solve these problems. The second half of the 1790s were truly incredible about how close our country came to failing well, our founders are worried about republics. Republics fail in their infancy. Joseph Ellis, I'll give you a couple more lines from the farewell address. But first, I'll just say, you know, today when presidents give their final speech, it's basically a laundry list of everything they feel they've accomplished. Washington's was a series of warnings he offered in humility and modesty. He offered these warnings and he talked about partisanship or faction. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. Hello, January 6th, yeah. right? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Washington got a pretty good free pass in his first term, but in the second term, opposition, organized opposition, organized by Madison and, and Jefferson, as a matter of fact, in what became the Republican Party. By the way, it's not called the Democratic Republican Party. It's called the Republican Party. You always remind um, me of that. Well, Washington the, didn't like the, the criticism the, the, himself. He the, was being criticized. The major outlet for the opposition was a magazine called The Aurora, it was edited by Benjamin Franklin Bache, Franklin's grandson. And give you the sense, they released documents alleging to show that George Washington throughout the war was secretly a British spy. These are letters that the British published during the war to try to undermine Washington's authority. And everybody knew they were forgeries, but they came out again. Thomas Paine, when Washington retired, said, we all devoutly pray for his imminent death. So this is scatological stuff here. And our contemporary attempts to say what's like our time and people say it's civil war. I think the 1790s is a better analogy. What Washington can't understand, nor can his successor, Adams, and they're the first presidents in the country, they cannot understand political parties. Jefferson himself, who founded the first political party, said, if I must go to heaven in a party, I prefer not to go at all. 
So they perceive the emergence of organized opposition. They don't see it's legitimate. Well, Washington see, didn't care for the criticism either. He was a bit well. No, I mean he, he for good reason because he and it was scatological, and they didn't even have the internet then. God knows what <laughs> would have happened if that had been present for him. But Washington and Adams both have a view of the presidency as the president is a person who stands above party, the person who transcends popular opinion, who doesn't listen to the polls, but acts in the public interest. We are a republic. Res publica, things of the public. Throughout the founding period, people have a very difficult time understanding this. The word democracy was an epithet. Democracy was a form of government in which people were susceptible to mob rule and to shysters and all kinds of false prophets. That's what they thought. And Adams could quote you Tacitus and Cicero and endlessly on that. Washington and Adams are the two presidents that think Jefferson changes this. this. The first two presidents cannot understand that parties can have a value. The political parties can be a form of disciplining debate and creating the idea of a legitimate opposition. So unlike France, where if you disagree, you send them to the guillotine or in the Russian Revolution, when you disagree, you send them to the firing squad wall here. The losers go into retirement and try to win the next election. That's happening in the 1790s. And neither Washington nor Adams can understand that. From Joseph Ellis' book here, uh, His Excellency, Doug, reading from page 224. I do this on my podcast a lot. (laughs) He says, I consider this insurrection, referring to the Whiskey Rebellion, the first formidable fruit of the democratic societies. These societies were groups of people who criticized the government. He blamed an insurrection then or a rebellion on this type of thing. Yeah, these were what he called famously the self-created societies, you know, which he saw as emulating these French revolutionary societies, which had essentially overturned the order of Europe through their agitations. And he saw them as sort of outside the bounds of legitimate political behavior as he understood it. He's like, well, we have a a representative government where there are elections. And if you don't like the policies that people make, then you vote out the people at the elections. And that's the appropriate place where political action by the people should take place. And of course, in the 1790s, as Joe's pointing out, you're seeing this different idea of how politics is going to work in a world where the ethos is popular, where the uh, the notion that the people are sovereign is a real thing. And of course, today we would call it sort of democratic culture, where the people are actively playing a role in criticizing their government and organizing themselves and in some ways protesting in the streets, agitating in this way. And uh, yeah, this was brand new. Washington is a man of the 18th century. You know, he is generationally challenged, and he and Adams, I think. You know, and he grew up in a world with elections. There were elections to the House of Burgesses in Virginia. But the ideal notion of the right people to represent the county in that case was the most disinterested men, men that were wealthy enough, that had enough influence, they couldn't be bought, that they wouldn't have to promise any voters what they were going to do. They were going to see beyond their immediate self-interest and think about the county's interest, the public good, the popular good. And Washington goes to his grave still being a creature of that culture. The other thing is he also lived through the American Revolution, and he understands what happened to the British, you know, that things like the Whiskey Rebellion, it could look a lot to him like, uh, you know, Lexington and Concord. If you're going to send an army out west, what's going to come back? Isn't it going to be your army or is it going to be an army of farmers marching back on the Capitol? So no, they had threatened uh, yeah. to march on Boston. And, yeah, yeah. you know, and it, it's it, here, it's, you know, the, the echoes, the farmers of Western Pennsylvania yeah. moved their grain to the East in the form of whiskey. And so the tax on whiskey hit them hard. Yeah, yeah. And they said, well, all our representatives from out here voted against it. Right. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and, said, and so now we're being taxed without our consent, which is an echo of the revolutionary slogan. Well, the problem is now you're in a nation in which the other states voted the other way and you have to go along. Yeah. Well, that same problem will happen with Shays Rebellion, where Western Massachusetts, where I live, rebels against this for the same kind of 
taxation or mortgage closures. And the definition of representation has to change when you after the Constitution, because Washington grows up in a Virginia where a representative is somebody that lives next to you. It was a great proximate. He knows your interest because he shares it. Once you go into a nation sized republic, that's no longer the case. You don't know your representative personally in the same way. And therefore, the definition of representation itself has to change. And it hasn't done so yet in the 1790s. And I think the what are the rules of the game in political culture in this new national polity, which is federal, you know, is still being developed. And it's being Absolutely. developed in, a, in another age of revolution where there's all the, the French immigrés and the rhetoric from the French Revolution as well as the memory of the American Revolution. So it's a, it's a dynamic moment and it's so fraught and so fragile from Washington's point of view. This is something that they're just trying to get established. And then if everybody's just going to run around and basically dictate to the legislators how to behave outside of the electioneering process, uh, you're really creating the, the recipe for chaos. But I think the one thing we also didn't talk about here, though, is the notion of the rule of law. Because Washington understands, even if it's a bad law, it's a constitutionally applied law. The Congress has the right to impose this kind of an excise tax, or it's not an excise tax, this kind of a, a levy, and the proper place to get rid of that law is by Congress, an action of Congress. And he, as the chief executive, his only role is to execute the law. So at a certain point, after warning upon warning, he's got to figure out how to make sure the law is actually executed. Well, they sent the, the army out there to... Well, yeah, he doesn't have an ATF. No, or IRS. <laughs> you know, they didn't pay he's the, the only tax. He's the only president in American history to lead troops in combat, as far as Harrisburg, I think. And and they by then, the, the rebels have realized they're, they're outgunned and yeah. they give up. You know, so as a 21st century journalist, my response when politicians complain about criticism is tough. But... I get Washington's points about the messiness and potential swoonishness and danger of too much. He's basically making a warning about too much democracy. Yeah. That's how I read it. And in a context in which this is a brand new thing, you know, you don't have the memory of successful protests that don't lead to something bad yes. in a way. But other thing I will point out, and among the many gifts that Jefferson has given us as historians, is he kept his little diary while he was in the cabinet meetings. And there's a great story that comes out in the context of this, which Joe knows well. You know, it's a typical day where Hamilton's being annoying and Knox is being inflammatory. And Jefferson writes in his diary, oh, you know, Hamilton was annoying. But one of these days is the day when Knox brings in these copies of a newspaper, the Freno's uh, National Gazette, which is an opposition paper that's emerging. And Washington loses it. He gets incredibly angry. And he's like, this man sends me newspapers every day as if I'll be a distributor of the papers. And he starts ranting and raving. And he's claiming that I want to be a king and I've never wanted to be anything but back at my farm. And, you know, he goes on and on. And Jefferson records all this in his little diary, which is great for us. But you know what Washington <laughs> doesn't do? He doesn't say... Let's send over a bunch of guys to break up the printing press and throw the guy in jail. <laughs> you know, all politicians hate being criticized, but some mm -hmm. of them do things that they shouldn't do about it. Washington mm -hmm. just complained and uh, and ranted and raved. And so. to call these newspapers, they were scurrilous. They were libelous. I mean, the 1790s, mm -hmm. as mentioned. So we have one more issue to get to in this the first part of this two-part series of conversations, and that is empire and foreign policy. You know, Washington died about a century before the big public debate erupted over whether the U.S. should control non-contiguous territory, Spanish-American War. He died a century and a half before the U.S. would ever be called a global superpower, whose role was to intervene in the affairs of other countries to contain something called Soviet communism. But Washington... Joseph Ellis, he believed in empire, did he not? A North American empire. What place did Washington believe Native American people should have or would have as European mm. settlers pushed to the West as he wanted them to do? Two-part answer here. Washington, and he's clearest about this in his last letter, uh, open letter to the various states. The future of America does not lie with Europe. And he develops this in the farewell address later. The future of America lies to the West, that America has inherited this huge empire. At times, it ends in the Mississippi, a third of a continent, the biggest trust fund that any emerging nation has ever acquired. 
and the development of that and the continuation of that expansion, it will later be called manifest destiny, is the future. It's a vision which lasts for about a century. American isolation, the focus on the development of the interior. The American foreign policy, in fact, is domestic expansion of, of the United States. What about those 150,000 Native Americans or there upon to live east of the Mississippi? Washington makes a very heroic effort during the first year of his presidency, and it's prompted by Henry Knox, his secretary of war, who has served with him as artillery officers throughout the war. And Knox says, if things keep going the way they're going, the future of the native population will only be known in the history books. And this is at odds with the values that you and I, George, believed we were fighting for throughout those seven and a half years of the war. And your legacy is tied to a resolution, a peaceful resolution of this dilemma. And they come up with something called the Treaty of New York. And it takes a certain argument that's distinctive, that the native tribes are discrete nations, that the Creek nation or the Iroquois nation is just as real as France or England and should be recognized as sovereign nations. That has a political implication. If they are sovereign nations, that means that the executive branch has the authority to legislate for them with the endorsement of the Congress, two thirds of the Congress, and they pass the Treaty of New York. They bring a group of 38 Creek chiefs to the Capitol, which is in New York, for the summer. And uh, Abigail describes them, he said, the first savages she ever saw. And at any rate, they signed this treaty. And the idea is, to be swift, we want to create for the Creek tribe this homeland, which would be eastern Georgia and most of Alabama. And that area will be Indian country. White settlers have to bypass that area. And any by settlers that don't do that will be thrown out by the American military, supposedly. It is an attempt to reach an accommodation with the Native Americans that avoids Indian removal. Washington believes eventually these Native American states will be assimilated into the United States over a long period of time. It fails because they can't enforce it. Cox says it would take 35,000 troops to keep the borders clear. The total army at that time is less than 3,000. It's impossible to implement. Washington says it's the biggest failure of his presidency. He says that after he retires. And he says nothing but a Chinese wall will keep the white settlers in Georgia from crossing over and occupying these native lands. Once again, it's the people that's a problem here. People want to pursue their happiness and that means land. And the Native Americans are on the land. And there is no way to stop them. Um, just as there was no way for George III to stop the American expansion across the Alleghenies in 1763. The line it's, of proclamation. Yeah, proclamation. So that Indian removal becomes inevitable in the founding era. It doesn't get implemented until Jackson. One of Washington's greatest legacies is John Marshall. And Marshall is Supreme Court Justice in 1829, 1830, when the issue comes up under Jackson of whether you can remove the Cherokee. And he attempts to impose the values that Washington had. He said that that is a nation. He says it is a quasi nation. And Jackson says, Mr. Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. If there are two great tragedies, of the American founding, and there are. And one of them is a failure to reach a just accommodation with the Native Americans. Washington made the most heroic possible effort to avoid that consequence. For me, the failure to end that is a Greek tragedy rather than a Shakespearean tragedy. I don't see how you could stop the demographic flow across without a couple million frontal lobotomies. Wow, Joe covered it really in a powerful way. Uh, you know, I think that to take a step back, you know, Washington, his whole orientation was towards the West. 
at a young age. He inherits a farm from his father when he's young, but it's it's not a very productive piece of ground around Fredericksburg. It's not going to be where his future is. And he's a surveyor of Culpeper County by age 17, and then very much involved with the Fairfaxes in the exploitation of <laughs> northern parts of northern Virginia's lands in what is now the Shenandoah Valley and beyond into West Virginia. Uh, you know, and that's what is the frontier of Virginia at the time. He's coming up. So he's out on the frontier at an early age. He recognizes that as his future. He's buying lands. It's not surprising that all his brothers end up in what is now West Virginia. He, of course, ends up taking a different tack by marrying Martha. But he also acquires lots of Western land through his service in the French and Indian War. And this is Indian land. This is Indian land the Virginians had claimed for many years. Through the American Revolution, the British failed to acknowledge any Indian claims in the treaties with the victorious American rebels. It's uh, really quite astonishing that British and Native American allies are completely forgotten at the Treaty of Paris. Uh, they're completely left out of it. This is astonishing, of course, to the Iroquois and others who had fought on the side of the British. Uh, the Creek, I mean, they were never conquered at all by anybody. Uh, in fact, in the Spanish Treaty, never recognized the, the same boundaries that the British Treaty did. So they were still considered unconquered. And so it, it is an interesting context to see how then the young United States is going to deal with these Native American groups who are by the Treaty of Paris, within their boundaries, but uh, by their own still potent existence, you know, still have an ability to control their destiny, at least in the short term. The reality is Washington is coming out of a perspective that's formed from the perspective that Virginia planters had had experienced over the hundred years before the American Revolution, that essentially Native American groups, whether through war or through demographic failure, were going to be disappearing. They could not live side by side with the husbandry and the expansion of settlement. And in fact, somebody like George Mason, Washington's neighbor here, you know, argued very strenuously against war with Native Americans because his argument is that as the population grows, they will just disappear, quote unquote. That is to say, their populations will diminish. Their own style of husbandry is not able to survive next to settled agriculture of, uh, of the kind that had been seen in Virginia for 100 years. And so their perspective is one that these populations would not be able to be sort of competitive over the long term. You know, and so Washington could be patient or could advocate for patience because, as Joe said, he kind of this idea that, well, we need to be just with the Native Americans. We need to protect the ground they have. But he wasn't really worried about the long term because he felt like they would eventually fall away or assimilate in some way. And he would ask them to take up the plow and he would ask them to, quote unquote, become civilized. But the federal government wasn't strong enough to stop the flow of Anglophone immigrants into the interior. And there wasn't a lot of interest to do it either. And so it is a, a tragedy, you know, if your idea is that Native Americans should have controlled that area in perpetuity forever, the demographics were such that they were completely on number. I mean, it was, uh, yeah, it was going to be very difficult to see how that was going to persist. Disease destroyed their numbers often before. Yeah, they... disease, failure of their, you know, their way of life looked like a failure. You know, it's a cultural despondency. You know, you're basically become dependent upon Western manufacturers for your own tomahawks, your bows and arrow, your guns and muskets. They're not some self-sufficient people by the late 18th century. They're dependent upon, you know, this trade with the West. And what do they have to trade? You know, that's diminishing all the time. They have land to trade. And so they're selling land and they're moving West and they're selling land. And, you know, and, and so it's a cycle in which you could just allow market forces to have that, that land taken over eventually. So as we've been discussing here, George Washington's legacy is complicated and the man and all his complexities and all his importance in the American story presents institutions such as Mount Vernon with the challenge of preserving that legacy and educating generations of Americans. That'll be the subject of our next conversation as History As It Happens goes on location, podcasting from inside the Washington Library with Doug Bradburn and Joseph Ellis, a podcast from the Washington Times.